for those of you who like bloopers. I thought we'd start with this. You know what I forgot is I forgot to say, let's take this off camera because that way I don't get any glitches with the sound. So I'm going to turn my camera off. If you'll do the same. Let's see. Oh, so this is just all audio. It's all audio. What happened? You clean your whole house? <laughs> you, don't you don't see this set off and I, oh man. Okay, wait, let me look. Welcome to 365 Brothers. I'm your host, Robin Shine. This podcast introduces you to black men from across the United States, their wisdom, their experiences, their joys. It also shares some of the triumphs after diversity. Basically, this podcast is about the humanity of black men, just as it could be about the humanity of women, of white, of brown, of yellow. I focus on black men in this podcast because of the statistics, the facts, that black men are more likely to be stopped by the police without a justifiable cause. Now, if you're questioning that, this podcast is the place for you to be. I ask each man the same 11 questions, and one of them asks about their interactions with law enforcement. The point of that question is to show the commonality in who is stopped, regardless of profession, regardless of age. Now, the other thing is to just share the diversity of experiences of black men outside of what you see on TV, in movies, outside of the stereotypes and the tropes. This is 365 Brothers. Today, we are speaking with a native of South Central, native Los Angelino. He is an actor, singer, and producer. We're speaking with Jensen Atwood. Welcome, Jensen. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to get in this conversation with you. But before we do, is there anything that you'd like to share with the listeners so they can get to know you better? Um, I'm just I'm just a dude. I'm just <laughs> the guy next door. I mean, um, whatever accolades that I've achieved in my life, you know, however people decide to look at me is is on them my reality is i'm just i'm just the guy next door okay but since you did say whatever accolades you have just hit us with two um well uh probably the two biggest things in my career as an actor have been um working opposite halle berry and their eyes are watching god and playing the character of Wade on a cable series called Noah's Ark. So those are probably two, two of many. Woo, woo, you you pushing my line, man. <laughs> I always say that, you know, I, one of the things I want to do is I'm sharing all the stories, of people from different professions. I'm trying not to do celebrities, but you know, you, you celebrity here. Now, here's the thing though. What I also realized is that a percentage of black men are celebrities and not every celebrity is having this conversation. So, you know, I'm not nixing that rule listeners. I'm just saying, you know, we do have, this is about the full variety of professions that black men are in. And some of our black men, many of our black men are really doing it as actors. So with that, well, let's get into the questions. Okay. What is a favorite song or movie either now or all time? The two movies that popped into my mind as I read this question um, were uh, DiCaprio's Romeo and Juliet and um, a not so serious movie uh, called Friday. So those would probably be my uh, top two movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, why? why? Um, Well, and then as far as songs, There's a song on that soundtrack of DiCaprio's Romeo and Juliet called um, Kissing You that is phenomenal um, that I just love as well. And so as far as the movies, why those are my favorite movies, 
Well, Friday, because it it gives a, a pretty close idea of my childhood growing up or just even life uh, growing up in L.A. or South Central L.A. So that that's one of the reasons. And it's hilarious. Friday, mm, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. May, may I just say I teach high school and even now. If I talk, if I make any reference when I'm trying to be funny and I make a reference to something from Friday, every kid knows it. It is a classic. 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 No doubt about it. And then um, and then uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Um, The acting, you know, it's a classic story. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, I'm a, a, I'm a romantic at heart. And, um, you know, the vehicles, the guns, it just was just visually stunning. Yeah, it's just a great movie. Okay. You mentioned both the movie, that that movie, and then you do say you're romantic, and then that song you're talking about. Tell us what, what because, you know, they're all kind of romantic songs, but what is it about that song that is just, has it stand out for you? Um, I, I want to say maybe it was the performance of it. Um, it it's just, it, it it just brings up so many emotions inside of me of, of love, of loss, of, of pain. It just brings out so many different emotions in me. It's just a, it's just a deep touching song. Yeah. What's a favorite childhood memory? So the one that keeps popping into my head was um, a, a time when I was playing in the backyard and I heard a commotion in the alley. And I looked over the fence and saw that my next door neighbor, uh, who was very much family to me, like my little brother, he was he was getting jacked. He was getting jacked by some gangbanger in the neighborhood. And um, I I hopped the fence because there was no way I was going to leave him alone facing what nobody should have to face as a child. He was younger than me as well, and I was able to defuse the situation, and everybody walked away, um, you know, unscathed for the most part. That's probably one of my favorite childhood memories. <laughs> yeah. Why, why that one, do you think? Why that one? Um, I felt like I, I, I made a difference. I felt like I could make a difference. I was able to help somebody that I love and I care about. You know, it's, it's just it's just so much stupidity that I've grown up with. And so it felt good to step in. The, the feeling of helping my brother, helping mm-hmm. somebody that I, I loved and cared about was, was the thing that uh, stuck with me the most. And later on in life, I actually had forgot all about it. And, and he had mentioned it to me maybe a couple months ago and uh, how much he appreciated it and how much it meant to him. And so, yeah, it's always stuck with me. That's phenomenal. That's great. Um, Thank you for sharing that with us. Let's talk about accomplishments. I asked this question in two parts. First, an accomplishment that means the most to you personally. And then secondly, um, an accomplishment that other people are like, what? Or, whoa. So let's start with the first. What's an accomplishment that means the most to you personally, Jensen? Uh, for me, one of, one of the, um, the, the moments that just stand out the most to me in my head was, I don't know if it was necessarily a specific thing, but I just remember the feeling of being able to take care of myself doing what I wanted to do. When I, when I set out to be an actor, I didn't have anybody, you know, to show me the way. And so if most of everything that I did was trial and error. And I started off as a background actor. It's how I earned my SAG card. It's how I got most of my experience. And, um, you know, people, people talked down about being a background actor, but I took it in stride because, you know, for me, it was a stepping stone forward. 
And I just remember after doing it for, I want to say maybe two years, I was a regular on two shows, uh, The Parkers and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And with those two jobs and hustling other gigs here and there, I was able to, for the first time in my life, take care of myself doing what I wanted to do. I was able to pay my bills and I was able to eat. And I just remember um, getting a check. I don't remember the job, but it was a, it was a golden hour check. And a golden hour check is the most money that you can make as a background actor. And I just remember sitting in my car looking at the check and crying, you know, mm. you know, it, today it probably wouldn't be that much money, but at the time it, it meant it was the world to me. And just the idea of me, accomplishing my goals on my own. I, I will, I'll never forget that feeling. That's awesome. <laughs> what about the accomplishment that others are like, what? Wow. That's easy. Halle Berry, kissing Halle Berry. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's simple. I, I've never seen my dad so proud of me, you know, for the longest time. I, I didn't even have a name. I was introduced as he kissed Halle Berry. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even Jensen anymore. And um, I, I know just like the start of this interview, you know, we, my introduction was that I'm a human being. I'm the guy next door. I understand that some people see me as a celebrity because of my accomplishments, but I'm just a dude. I'm just, I'm just a black man from South Central that had a dream and has and still do everything in my in my power to make that dream a reality. And so for for a a kid, a poor kid with nothing from the hood to be looked at as some type of celebrity because I kissed Halle Berry is <laughs> it's crazy. It's it's yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. That's awesome. Now I have to ask you, since um, you worked as a background actor for a couple of years um, before getting a break that, you know, really made a financial difference. And, and then, you know, you didn't say exactly how many years until you had that moment, but did you study acting? How did you, how did you, since you, you were kind of, you know, you said you were on your own, how did you get there? Like what, what, what was your course, you know, the steps, like, how did you get there? Well, one of my sayings is one foot in front of the other is, is always putting one foot in front of the other learning. Biggest thing was learning, learning everything I possibly could. And so, uh, doing background work, uh, I had an agenda. I wasn't just happy to be on set. Uh, I was there to learn. I wasn't there to stare at celebrities. I, I was there to be a better actor. So every day I stepped on set, I used it as class for my future. And there's certain things about being on set that class doesn't teach you. You know, there's a, there's a certain etiquette on set. There's a certain um, hierarchy on set. And those are things that you can only really learn on set. And so I took, just like the rest of my life, I mean, I, I took it as lessons. And then I got into class. I got into real class. I trained with Eric Morris, who, in my opinion, and, and not only my opinion, is one of the greatest teachers to ever teach acting. And I studied with him for four years. I, I talked to people who were respected in the business, and I listened to their opinions. And what they told me was what was going to separate me from everybody else. And everybody else is literally thousands of people that move to L.A. every day to, to chase a dream. What was going to separate me from them was my training. And so I took it very serious and um, I took every class that I possibly could. And I, and I looked for the best to train with. And I never took a moment for granted that of a lesson that I could be learning. As you're describing it, I picture you in your acting classes, one of those students like like you you you've already described it but I'm, i guess i'm just saying it out loud for myself it, it's you know there is an intensity in learning there's an intensity of of noticing of observing and not letting any not wasting 
any observation that you can make. Is that that what you're saying? No doubt about it. It's having a plan. It's having an agenda. It's not just, you know, it's not necessarily just enjoying the moments. It's it's creating your own moments from the moments that are given. Mm -hmm. That same thinking is also, I, I feel like, what's kept me alive growing up in in South Central is is paying attention and learning the lessons that are being taught. You know, I, I never was the type of person that had to put my hand in the fire to know that it was hot. <laughs> I believe you. I believe mm -hmm. I believe you because I'm I'm paying attention and I saw I saw your reaction, you know, when you put your hand in the fire. I, I saw your hand after you took it out the fire. So I don't I don't need to do that. <laughs> I heard you scream. I saw you cry. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Let's talk about words. What's a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? <sighs> we live in such a strange time. I, um, I find myself quoting more memes than anything <laughs> nowadays. And, um, there's two quotes after reading that question that popped into my head and that are still popping into my head. Um, one was from a meme and that helped me recently tremendously. Well, actually two. So, so I'm going to okay, give well, three, I'm gonna gonna three. I'm going to give three total. Two were from oh, me. Look. Oh my goodness. Brothers. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't narrow it down to one. I can't narrow it down to one. All uh, right. All right. We good. So, but so I, you got me on. You got me at the edge of my seat about this meme. So please start with that one and tell. Okay, me I will. I will. So two are from memes, and another one is is from my dad, which I, I didn't get a whole lot from my dad. But this one quote had always stuck with me. But as far as the memes go, um, don't set yourself on fire to keep other people warm. And the other one was, it is okay to fight for someone who loves you, but it's not okay to fight for someone to love you. Mm. Those are my two meme quotes that have helped me tremendously in the past even six months. Wow. That first one, my eyes popped. I was like, what? Okay. A second one is good too. Let me tell you. That first one, I'm, I have to admit, I was still enjoying that one as you were speaking the second one. But yes, <laughs> those are great. Yeah. And then um, the quote from my dad uh, that I've that's always stuck with me is uh, to work smarter and not harder. Tell me more. What about that? How, you know, just, you just you just say it, and I'm like, okay, you drop the mic. Could you pick it back up? <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as the uh, smarter, not harder, is you know, you have a mind, you have a brilliant mind. Why not use it? Why not? Why not use it to the best that you possibly can? You know, why not take a moment to figure out the best route? Why not take time? to do the right thing instead of the right now thing. And it's always stuck with me. And so before I, before I break my back, I'm definitely gonna think about what is the best move. I am definitely hearing a theme. Um, what is a conversation moment or event that stands out as either changing the trajectory of your life or has had a significant impact on your life? Um, I was, I'm a, I'm a veteran of the United States army. I was a tanker and I really wasn't sure of what I was doing with my life. I really wasn't sure of my purpose. I was in South Korea on the back of my tank M1A2 Abrams shaving out of my canteen cup in the middle of a rice field. And I looked around and I thought to myself, what the fuck are you doing here? And I couldn't really figure out how I ended up in that moment. But it was that moment that also made me think 
you know, bro, what, what do you want to be doing with your life? What, what, what should you be doing with your life? And I always say this and it, and it, it starts to sound weird, but it, it's, it's my truth. You know, Whis- God whispered in my ear on that day, you know, why don't you try making money doing what you've always done? And from that moment, the only thing that I wanted to do was act. The only thing that I felt like I should be doing was acting. I felt like it was a calling from God and I had found purpose. I had found purpose in a moment where I was lost. As a, you know, drug addicts talk about hitting rock bottom. I guess that was kind of a bottom for me. And it was it was that moment that made me realize what what my purpose was on this earth. Yeah. Well, first, I acknowledge you for hearing the whispers. You Man. Know, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't hear whispers. <laughs> I had to choose a whole bunch of different options and then have none of them work out before I was like, I bought this book, Experiencing God. And even then he had to create a series of unlikely events for me to go. So wait, you really want me to be a teacher? Is that what you're saying? (laughs) And I have loved it ever since. And so, you know, as you say that you heard it, it's just like, I'm just like, yeah, okay, that's cool for you. And then the other thing is, I I don't know if it's because I'm talking to someone whom I know to be an actor and producer and in that industry, but as you were describing it, I swear I could see the field. I, I saw it as the, you know, that that crucial scene in a movie after all these strange events, things that didn't work out. And then you know, like I could feel the slight breeze, the whole thing. And even I can even hear the music. <laughs> as you realize what you ought to be doing and then you go in and you you know figure out when your next ex- exit date can be and so forth but anyway um that's awesome i know there are a lot of people who are are like me or even worse you know it's like i couldn't hear the whisper god had to actually kind of make my life a mess before i was like okay so you mean this thing that i really love to do like when i was teaching and it was a lot of fun so that <laughs> right. um but that's the funny part about it all is yeah, you know, we, we we keep the noise going around us. And and it's when we're the quietest is we when we can hear our own truths. You know, it's it's almost like, you know, you, you have to go all the way around the world to find your tail that's been with you the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I just acknowledge the saying yes to who you are. Yeah. Um, that's great. So now I'd like to ask, what is a moment event that stands out as, you know, like highlighting or signifying your experience as a black man in the United States? Wow. I, I um, when I read this question, uh, the, what stood out to me was in the United States. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Man, this is a, a tough one for me in a, a little bit. Because for a long time, I, I felt like I was making up stories, even though I knew it was the truth. As far as my experience growing up as a black mm-hmm. man, as a black child, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s in South Central LA, when our government of the United States of America was trying to kill me, not just me specifically, but anybody who looked like me and anybody who lived in the same neighborhood that I lived in. They were funding a guerrilla war in another country by flooding my neighborhood with cocaine and automatic weapons. And you're talking about the Iran-Contra scandal and funding Nicaraguan's war? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just sharing that in case anybody's like, what, 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 what? Right. Yes. right. Look right. it up, people. Look it up. If you don't know, go ahead. Oh, the, oh, Snowfall is a whole series based on it right now. There, there, there's so much more truth now than when I was a kid. It actually makes me want to cry a little bit because mm-hmm. for so long being told that you're crazy or yeah, right, or that can't be true, you know, to then later on in life, push it to the side as if, okay, Jensen, maybe you need to stop talking about this because you are looking crazy. Mm -hmm. You are looking like something's wrong with you. You are looking like a liar. You are looking like everything that I was not. And then when the world started getting more educated, it, it brought some relief to me, but it also just brought so much pain to me. You know, my experience as a black man in America has been an experience of survival. Uh, it, it's been an experience of oppression. But at the same time, a building of strength that probably nobody has on this planet because of just being a black man in America. So I don't even know if I answered the question, but, but that is in so many ways. Well, one thing that you said that I just want to pick up on is um, you say there's a strength that black men have because of what, you know, the gauntlet that must be, run through, walk through every single day of various experiences of um, an infrastructure that reinforces um, laws that, you know, began in racism, right? Right. And so I, I just love and appreciate you reframing it, recontextualizing it. I love that you say straight out that while it's not a welcome experience to have, what gets done with it is can be done with it. I'll say is a strengthening. No doubt about it. So I I appreciate that. The other thing I have to ask, I'm like blown away that you knew that you're pointing to knowing that this was, you know, a government funded issue at an age earlier than most. Can you tell me when you knew and what was it that had, you know, this? Um, well, I, I, I couldn't tell you that I knew that it was our government. I, I could tell you that there was a bigger picture. I could tell you that I knew that there was more going on than what exactly what I was seeing. When the word was going around in the street that you could go, you could go to the train, uh, train tracks because a train happened to stop on the tracks and there happened to be a car uh, with weapons in it and that you could go get you go get you a gun you did you get you you, did you get you a gun what what you talking about bro they got automatic weapons on the train right now man you crazy get out of here dead ass there it's a trap you know it sounds like oh this is a great thing but to me it was like that just don't happen right that just don't i hear you And again, I'm like, I'm just picking up a theme here. Extraordinarily observant, extraordinarily observant, not pretending you don't see. I think a lot of times for a lot of reasons and in a lot of different areas of our life, um, we pretend not to know what's right there in front of us. And also the, the police, man, the police in my neighborhood were were as crooked as crooked can be. The stories that I'm telling, they're not from a movie. I saw undercover police officers doing drive-bys in cars that have been impounded from rival gang members. No way. With my own I mean, eyes. I know I believe you, but I'm just like, what? Oh, and, and you can and you can look this up too. Rampart, the Rampart division is is Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it was was the division in my neighborhood that was one of the worst in history. But You're that, part of the Rampart Division? Yep. I'm from oh, South wow. Central LA, the east side, born and raised. Okay. I, I, still okay. Live here. I still live there now. I'm sitting in the house I grew up in. Nice. Oh, my goodness. Wow. 
Okay. And, and for anyone who doesn't know, again, if you're not from the LA area, that, that may not mean anything, but there was a time when Rampart Division was just overflowing in the news because they finally, you know, they're finally doing they're some caught. internal investigating. Yeah. They finally, well, someone finally cared. That part. <laughs> and my guess would be somebody went way too far in the wrong situation. And then it was like, now see, you done messed it up. And then they had to come clean. But whatever, I speculate and speculation don't count for nothing. Um, but wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And um, what was the name of the series that you said we could check out? Oh, uh, Snowfall. A show I'm well, still trying to get on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? So it's in production. It's a series. Yeah, I want to say they're in their third or fourth season. Wow. OK, well, with that, you kind of led us right into the next question, um, which is about any experiences you've had personally with law enforcement. Man. <laughs> in in general, I, I haven't had the best experience experiences with law enforcement. They have been oppressors. In, in my neighborhood. Um, and like I said, I've, I've seen undercover cops, you know, do horrible crimes. Well, so, can you give us an example of an experience you've had? Wow. Which one do I choose? Oh, here's here's one of my favorite ones. Uh, born and raised in South Central L.A. Uh, I graduated from South Pasadena High School, which is very different than South Central. It is a very white school white and Asian neighborhood. I lived on the outskirts of it for the most part, El Sereno, which is a lot like South Central. And uh, another neighboring city is Highland Park, which is beautiful now. It wasn't so beautiful when I was uh, in high school. Mm. Uh, but one of my buddies lived in Highland Park and we were uh, driving out of South Pass late at night. There were five of us in a Volkswagen Beetle, old school, not the new one, and we were pulled over probably about three blocks away from my my buddy Sife's house. And we're like frightened, like most kids, teenagers are when being faced by the LAPD or police department or South Pass or just a police in general. What they told us was they were pulling us over because a house was just robbed and we looked suspicious where we were going to put the stuff that we supposedly stole out of this house. Mm. Five brothers in a Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. It was as ridiculous as ridiculous could be. We were all pulled out of the car. We were all handcuffed. We were all put on the curb. We were all treated as if we were criminals. Again, we were teenagers ranging from 13 to uh, I think one of my buddies had just turned 18 or 19. We thankfully were let go because my buddy was pleading that he lived down the street and his mom came out of the house, thankfully, and was mm -hmm. able to calm the police down. They had to be calmed down? Well, they had to be put in a, a different uh, headspace. Um, and they usually, I, than I, they usually I know what you're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe not calm down is the right word, but. We no, I know what you're saying. In other words, they were jamming you up like you were thieves and interacting with you as if you were hardened criminals who, if they could just crack one of you or whatever, then they would solve like the greatest crimes of L.A. versus exactly. that they had pulled over some teenagers. Versus they, I'm the, I'm the star athlete to the local high school and with a couple of other star athletes, with a, a couple of other buddies that we were just hanging out with kids, children in a Volkswagen. That's all it was. But, but I also want to say, you know, as far as my experience with police officers, because most of them have been horrible experiences. I do want to say one, one time that it was actually, I was shocked. Oh, please. I, I, I love hearing both kinds because it's not about, this question is not about shaming police officers. It's about recognizing the racial profiling that happens and the impact of it on, on real men's lives. Um, right. But it, they're not all, not every brother has had a negative experience, though more have than not. Please give us another, give us another story. Give us another side. I have a hundred of those that I just shared right now, but I do have one that 
has always stood out to me. I was a passenger in a car that was going 70 miles an hour on a freeway that that killed someone. Um, if it wasn't for the airbag, he probably would have crushed me, came through the windshield. Uh, I was covered in his blood. Oh. It was a horrible, horrid accident. It totaled the car that I was in, um, was driving from Tampa, Florida to uh, Philadelphia. It happened in Jacksonville, Florida. And it, it was devastating, not only devastating, but traumatic to not only me, but the, the person that was driving as well. And we had to stay in Jacksonville while they did an investigation. And um, we didn't have anything. And the police officer, one of the police officers that showed up on the scene after we were pulled over on the side of the road after this horrid accident, you know, he he made sure that we were OK. And and it was one of the first times I think I was 19 years old. It was one of the first times in my life that I felt like I could depend on the police. He, he took us to the to the nearest hotel. He made sure that. We got enough stuff out of the car so we would be okay. Mm -hmm. He made sure that we could call the right people. It was just, it was an experience that I, I, you know, will never forget because he made me feel safe. He made me feel everything that I knew I was supposed to feel when I saw an officer instead of all of the things that I feel when I see an officer which is the end of my life, to be honest. I feel like this could be the end of my life every time I see an officer. Every time I see a police car behind my car, I think to myself, is, is this it? Um, thank you for sharing that and, um, that's horrible. and being that's horrible. vulnerable. That's horrible. I wanna cry right now because that's horrible. It's horrible to even hear me say it. Yeah. It's hard for me to hear, so I can't even imagine what it is for you to live. And I appreciate you sharing it because and even as a Black woman who's told cousins, I don't have children, I would have told them, but who's told cousins, you know, be careful when you talk to police, interact like this, here are the rules, here's this. It, it's like, this has been an education for me in just how traumatic these experiences are and how they build over time. And people who are concerned about the reform, the police movement, who are saying, well, wait, what, you don't want police in your area? It's like, well, if you relate it to them as a threat, a constant and perpetual threat to your actual breath, then you're not attached to seeing them stay in your neighborhood. You know, it's like their different communities have different experiences of who the police are. And the one that you just described, that's the experience that a person in Beverly Hills has. You know, it's both class and race. And I just appreciate that you had both so that because there are good cops out there. I've interacted with some. I've, I've had good experiences, but I, I, thank you. That's all I, I got. I have, I have relatives. I have relatives that are that are police officers. But but it also. I've had to seriously question, who are you hiring? That's the part that I, I cannot really grasp because it, to me, from my childhood to now being an adult, it seems like most of those criminals have joined the police force. You speak something <laughs> that is an obvious reform that would make a difference. And I'll just share some that just come off the top of my head. You have to be at least 25 before you can start so that you have some life experience. Require at least an AA or maybe even a BA. I know you don't think people with a BA will want to do that. Well, new, new economy. Yeah, they would. And then there's the training. And I think one of the things that, um, that I've only learned in doing a little more research into it and watching, I don't even know which documentaries, maybe it was from watching the 13th. Uh, 13, or I, I'm not sure, but I, I also know that the infrastructure for training cops, like it's the same companies, there's a handful of companies that go around training and they train them to see, they train them for combat. Right. 
they don't train them for. And that's why everybody's talking about community policing, because it, it just promotes a different relationship. So anyway, my hope is that this podcast contributes to the conversation and that when people hear these stories, that they that they really get it and that it contributes to an understanding of why reform is needed. Yes. So with that, if the United States was a woman, whether mother, lover, child, stranger, neighbor, friend, whatever, whichever, if the United States was a woman, what would you say to her? Why do you treat me this way? All all I've done is love you. All I've done is double the effort that anybody has ever done for you. My ancestors broke their backs to create you, and yet you still treat me as I'm your enemy. Well, what more? What more can I do? I I can't. That that, that is the answer to that question. I've, I've given everything that I am, and you still treat me as if you don't love me. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. There must be another man. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. One of my favorite, uh, uh, this one friend of mine, one of the things he said when I asked that question, he just said it so nonchalantly. I said, so what do you, what would you say to America? You know, the United States, I'm like, I want a divorce. (laughs) <laughs> I've been trying and trying and trying, and I just don't think this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love that one. I love it. And I, I hear a version of that, but I love how you ended that. That was so, that was so perfect. <laughs> it's got to be. Love, right? What is love to you, Jensen? Oh, what is love to me? Love is dedication. Love is food. Food is a big part of love for me. Yeah, those are the two things that stick out to me the most. Got it. So uh, where did this start with the food? (laughs) Probably from the greatest woman I've ever known in my life, which is Be My Granny. She was, she was beyond the a cook. She was a magician. She made literal magic in the kitchen. You're Unfo- making my mouth water. What do you, t- <laughs> you tell me some more? What you mean? I mean, she, unfortunately, she's not with us anymore. But I, I remember sitting in the nook in my granny's kitchen and talking with her, letting her know how amazing that she actually was, and and that when she was gone, that. This magic <laughs> that the <laughs> that the magic would be gone too. My my mom and my aunts they know some of her recipes, but there's something about love that can be put in a recipe. Mm. And, and she went in that kitchen almost every day and created love from magic. The best food that I've ever eaten and one of the greatest women that have ever graced this planet. And I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be the man I am today and I wouldn't be in the space of my career than I am without her. So. Wow. What did you learn from her? I mean, it's, it's you're not saying what it was, but it's clear like she. She demonstrated something. I mean, first of all, let me just acknowledge that I heard you say magic. And I heard that you, what I really hear when you say magic is she, she cooked with love and. It's, it's care. It's, it's concern. It's, it's time. It's dedication. And, and all of those things are included in, in the amazing dishes that she made. It wasn't just thrown together. It was thoughtful. And she knew, she knows, she knew, she knows me. She, she knows my relatives. She knows what each of us like and what we don't like. She knows the the right seasoning even. 
and and it's and she'll make adjustments according you know she'll make dishes according it, it was it was love it was it was what real it was what love is supposed to be you know time and 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 concern and and dedication and and compassion and and time more than anything you know time you know, we, people could give, give you all the presence in the world, but it will never replace presence of a human mm-hmm. being. Mm-hmm. And, and she will never, unfortunately, be replaced in my life. Oh, sorry. No, I, I'm, I love that you got to have such a woman in your life. I love that you were able to recognize her for who she was, know that you were a gift to her. Because I hear you made it clear to her that you recognized her gifts, her love, her generosity, her time, her devotion, her dedication, her attention. She treated and, and the way she, she treat that's the, it's the way she treated me. It wasn't it wasn't just words. It was it was actions. But everything that you just said was was everything that my my granny showed me. It wasn't just what she told me. Yeah. Well, I hope that you're able to hold it in your heart as a treasure because it's it's not the norm. You know, there's that book, The Five Love Languages. Um, there are different ways that people show their love and that one, and I can tell that this is just one way that she did it, but that one way that she was exceptional in demonstrating love was through the foods that she cooked and served. Exceptional would be the to put it lightly. <laughs> mm, mm, that says a lot right there. <laughs> I'm, and I don't know if you know, but I'm Creole. So when I'm I'm talking, Uh-oh. I'm talking gumbo, I'm talking about uh shrimp etouffee, I'm talking about jambalaya. I Stop mean, making me mad. Stop man, making me mad. Man, <laughs> man. My my one of my best girlfriends uh that I also teach with uh she's from Louisiana. Ooh, can she put her foot in some food? <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Well, I I, I, I bet you see Creole. Right. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yep. Well, now is when I ask you, what is something you've learned through your profession, training, experiences, or adventures? that you believe more black men should know, but don't, knowing that whatever you say benefits everyone. To the black men that are listening to this, I want them to know that they are kings. I want them to know really how amazing that they really are. We're pushed to think we are the least of society, but it is those that are the least of society that are trying to convince those that are greater that they are less. And it's not just because I'm pumping you up right now. It's not just because I'm being positive and I'm trying to put you in a positive light. I'm saying this because of your experiences. I'm saying this because of the trials by fire. That is why you are a king, black man from America. You have had to go through more than most human beings will ever go through their entire lives in just a short span. You have had to be better, double, as good as any of your so-called peers just to be looked at as normal. And let me tell you, there is nothing normal about you. When you walk into a room as an American black man, you are already a minority. And so you are being looked at. People are looking at you. They are looking to you. But the piece that is missing is the leader that you are because of your trials and tribulations, because of the fire that you've been through, you are the leader that they are looking for. 
and it is now time for you to step into your light. That is what I would love to tell the black men in America who are listening to this right now. Stop making yourself smaller. Stop buying in to who you think you should be and buy in to what your soul is telling you. Buy in to that voice that is, keeps telling you how great you are. You know it, but now it's time to walk in that light. Damn. Yeah. Well said. Well delivered. Um, thank you. I'm catching the Holy Ghost up in this piece, boy. <laughs> 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 look, look. Yeah, you're, you know, I, I, even, I always say. I don't know who that was right now, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I was, you silenced me for my, I, I sometimes edit out how long I'm silent. That was okay. a message. I don't know if it was just for me, but it was definitely a message. It was a message. I heard it. Um. So, Jensen, now that we've had this conversation, what did you get for yourself personally out of participating in this conversation? Man. I feel like I really need to think about it, but the thing that's, I think, pushing the most is I need to take some of my own advice and I need to step up and be the leader that I know that I am and that I have always been. But maybe, maybe people need a voice in this time and maybe I can be a part of that voice. Nice. This whole conversation I've been thinking, wow, he sounds like such an old soul. Like it, there's, it's like the things that happened when you were young, it just sound like someone of a, a wiser, mature, you know, presence would do and know whether it's the way that you understood who your grandmother was and what she was doing and really received it to being willing to help that brother out who was getting jammed up in the alley. And I'm not saying other brothers don't do that. I'm just saying the way in which you spoke about it and what it meant to you just stands out. And so I was thinking, wow, you, you just strike me as an old soul. And, and I mean that in the most wonderful way of being a contribution to the people around you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so so when you were speaking and you were saying what you would say to black men, and I was thinking about how you're an old soul, and I was like, uh-oh, who's speaking? <laughs> what incarnation was that? <laughs> and, and, me, yeah. and me having to fight back the, the tears and sitting back on this couch, I felt the same way. <laughs> God, I, and I feel, I feel uh, moved to say, you know, glory be to God. And, and, and my thanks to God, because I don't know, to be honest, where that just came from. It was very powerful. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. Certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, Please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love.